So let me take you back to 2010. What I'm about to tell you, I take no credit for because it was done by my predecessor. But from what I saw, was, uh, when I saw all this, that's why I joined the company two years ago, Synesis. So two, 2010, Synesis had about 150, 200 patients worth of data in acute leukemia, mainly relapse refractory leukemia. And we had a drug called rosuroxin that we thought was good and we thought it was clinically active. But as you know, trying to show a survival benefit in relapse refractory leukemia is a pretty tough uh, thing to do. And a lot of drugs have failed beyond, uh, before us. And so my predecessors thought, how can we be smart? How can we risk, uh, spread the risk of a trial and still achieve the goal of enrolling a large number of patients in a, into a trial? Vala has just closed at 712 patients. It took us 33 months to enroll at 116 sites in total. So it wasn't easy. But what we did along the way was we risk mitigated. And we did this through the um, adaptive design. So the original sample size was, is that working? Yeah, 450 patients. And the way it worked is we had an independent DSMB with an independent statistical, um, uh, statistical provider, which was Cytel. And they presented to the DSMB the data after 50% of the original number of events. The, and that was the interim analysis there. At that point, the DSMB could make one of four decisions. They could have stopped the trial for efficacy, very unlikely in a relapse refractory AML setting, and it didn't happen. They could have stopped the trial for futility. We didn't think that happened. We thought we had a drug that was active, and we knew it didn't have a toxicity profile that would make it futile. So that left us two options. One was to continue the trial as planned. And by that, we've got a graph here, a diagram here that shows the data was favorable, favorable enough to continue to the original sample size or the data was unfavorable and you'd continue to the original sample size, but a sample size adjustment wasn't required. But in fact, what happened was the DSMB said to us the data was promising. And by that we meant, we took it as meaning there's a clinical effect, but we need more patients. So the statistical plan allowed for a one-time sample size increase of 225 patients, one-time increase. It was predetermined. I don't know the rationale, the exact rationale used by the DSMB to increase the sample size. I wasn't privy to that discussion. That was done in closed session. The company had some input, but it was done in closed session. So I don't know how they made the decision. All I know is the data was promising enough and they requested an increase in sample size. So as a result of that, I now have a study that is powered across a broad range of clinical outcomes. Not just the original hypothesis, it's broader because there's more patients. In effect, I have a very well-powered study. And we just closed the enrollment of 712 patients, which means this is the largest company-sponsored study in relapse refractory AML. We couldn't have done it without the adaptive design. The reason is, if you go back and design this study from scratch without the adaptive design, the sample size is over 800 patients. And there's no way a small company of less than 30 people was going to raise the money required to conduct a phase three study of 800 patients in acute myeloid leukemia. You'd be kidding yourself going out to do this. So my CFO, CFO Eric Beerkolt, was very smart. What he said was, we will fund up until this point, and then we'll put some funding in place that's contingent on the sample size adjustment. And that's exactly what we did in September of last year. The DSMB told us that we had um, promising data and that they had increased the sample size and some funding was prearranged and it kicked in, which allowed us to complete the study. So on many levels, this is a great uh, way of approaching clinical trial design. You can tell I'm quite evangelical about this. I like this design. It's hard being a small company running a phase three study. But there's financial, there's patient enrollment, there are resource benefits of this. But to quote Zoran, the most important thing at this, with this trial design is you have to put everything in place you possibly can do to avoid operational bias. The FDA guidance is really, really clear on this. You mustn't introduce operational bias. So all this was done in closed session. Any data shared with the DSMB is held by Cytel. It's not held by the company. 
I see a tiny bit of blinded safety data, and that is it. I'm the only person in the company who's seen any data, significant data on this study, and it's just safety data. So I have no idea what the efficacy, how this drug is, um, how the study is progressing from an efficacy point of view. So we've maintained the blind, we've maintained strong operational control, we have a very strong firewall between us and the DSMB. All these things in, are in place, which means from an operational point of view, I think we've conducted a, a good study. Now, of course, the study may or may not work at the end, but that's not something I have control on. From the point up to now, we've conducted a good study. And I'd recommend, if you're thinking about a large phase three study, I'd recommend this kind of design. It's simple, it's easy to explain to investors, and operationally, it takes a little bit of work, but you can get it done. Is that Julie? I, we've never met, but you're, is that Julie? Yes, I saw your... Sure, please. Yeah. So I think this is really uh, great to, to discuss. I hope others do as well. Um, so one is obviously you have to increase the sample size, I assume, because you, you spend alpha, as the statisticians love to talk about, um, because you're looking at the data. But this also could be interpreted as the, the trial results are not going to be as favorable uh, and therefore, that's why you have to increase your sample size because your your delta is not going to be as big. Yes. So how did you how did you uh, set up the? I know this predated you somewhat, but how were the original assumptions set up? Were they set sure. up with a really high bar, knowing that you're likely to fall into that promising zone? Because the street could have interpreted this in a negative way. Yes. Yeah. No. Some people did. On the whole, most people didn't. But there are still some investors who did. The original hypothesis was that it was a 40% improvement in survival. We are now powered probably from 25 to 40% improvement in survival. It, it could be more reasonable. It doesn't mean we won't get 40% because the data was very mature. But we now have a broader range. In acute, you know, to look at the end game, what's the label here? I would be happy with a label that had 25 to 30% improvement in acute leukemia survival. That would be groundbreaking, and it would really change the standard of care. So if we don't get 40%, and you know, I can live with that, but that was the original hypothesis, but we're now powered across a broader range of outcomes. We should have a conference on financing. So my CFO, I keep mentioning him, Eric Bierkolk, smart guy, worth making a phone call to. He put in place a deal with Royalty Pharma. So we had a royalty stream that um, uh, investment that kicked off. And the level of the, uh, the, the cost of the investment to us varied based on what the outcome was. So when we had an interim analysis, uh, uh, the instruction to continue with the sample size adjustment, one of those options kicked in place, and uh, we got money from Royalty Pharma, which has enabled us to continue this trial. Okay, that was all set up beforehand, and that was the plan right from the beginning, was to have some financing that was contingent on the outcome of the interim analysis. I think if you don't do that, you have more of a problem.